great to be here. I, I, this is my third time in Lubbock. Um, it, it's always been nice. The only hard part is getting here. Um, if you try to come from the West Coast or from the East Coast, it's not the easiest place to get to, but I'm happy to be here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is something that I think is actually particularly for younger people. I think it's going to be really important, which is one of the things we're trying to find out now is what's happening to millennials and where are they going. You know, when I um, when when I was your age, um, I could move to California, and there, there really wasn't a, an issue. In 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 my era, when you know, in you know, back in the, you know when we had Dodge dinosaurs, um, one of the things that that you had is you had a lot of different places you could go that were affordable, that were growing. We're in a very different situation now. And so what's happened is we're seeing a migration, not go west, uh, not go to the big cities, but moving into the middle of the country. And um, I'll show you some of those numbers. And also, to understand that the long-term future of the United States cannot be Silicon Valley, Manhattan, Hollywood. Um, there isn't enough output there to run the country and there isn't enough opportunity for people. And I can certainly talk to you in uh, incredibly uh, uh, difficult detail about uh, California in particular, since that's my home. So let's just talk about a few things, just as sort of overviews. Um, what's happened over the last 10 to 20 years? And some of it, as we'll discuss, is, a, is policy. Some of it may be geography. The Northeast and the West Coast have become too expensive and highly regulated. These enormous differences in housing prices in particular did not exist 30, 40 years ago. They were basically, uh, most houses were about three times median income. Um, and that's still true most of Texas today, a little bit above that in Boston and some parts of Houston and Dallas. But fundamentally, that, that was a relationship everywhere. So you went, wherever you went, you paid about the same amount for housing. That has been changed dramatically, and that is going to have an enormous impact, I think, long term on where the demo demographics in this country are going to go. Middle class jobs are moving to the interior. What we're seeing increasingly in California is we're losing our middle, and New York as well, our middle range jobs. Um, so we've lost almost all our engineering firms. We've, we've lost, let's say, the headquarters of Nissan, the headquarters of Toyota. Um, because fundamentally, we, they, those companies cannot recruit people like you in two, three years to move to California. They certainly can't get them when they're in their 30s because if they want to get married and have kids, uh, you know, it, it's a, literally impossible to buy a house. I, I talked to my students in Chapman, out of 34 students. I asked, how many of you think you're going to be able to stay in California permanently? And about three or four out of 34. And I can tell you, has nothing to do with bad weather or, or lack of good scenery, because that we excel at. Um, we're particularly interested in millennials and also what's happening with um, uh, immigrants. Uh, you know, they're kind of the canaries in the coal mine, which I'll discuss. Um, and you'll be very surprised to see where immigration is growing, because it's not where you would think. I mean, part of the problem, frankly, I spent most of my life in the media. Um, is that the media is now concentrated basically in two or three places, and most of the reporters don't. They, they, they wouldn't know what planet Lubbock was on, much, much less what state. Um, and I think there will be a change in this country as people move more to the center. Uh, so instead of going west, they're going into the middle of the country. This is what we define as the heartland. And, uh, this is, uh, you can see it basically extends from the Canadian border in the Dakotas down here to Texas. Um, and it's, it includes the Rust Belt, but also includes a great deal of the Great Plains, um, which are somewhat different uh, kinds of region, and obviously parts of the South. And one of the things I'm working on now, maybe I'll be able to come back a year from now or two years from now with a study. We're trying to figure out which areas A, millennials are already going to, and where we think they're likely to. Um, now, part of what's driving this is jobs, as you can see, um, it's not necessarily every state in the, uh, in the heartland is a, has a great business climate, but uh, they're generally better, and the worst business climates tend to be overwhelmingly um, in the Northeast and in California. California, 
I have to say, because I've worked with businesses there, uh, people are just freaked out by what's happening and what's coming around. But then I saw a new level of insanity recently that Mayor, Mayor de Blasio in New York wants to ban hot dogs and because of global warming. And uh, I don't know. I mean, you can't get a Nathan's hot dog in New York. That just sounds, sounds treasonous. Um, okay. Um, so let's just take a look at some numbers. Um, California has done a little bit better in this last 10 years. A lot of it, almost all of it, really, because of Silicon Valley. But Texas has done much, much better. Um, but then if we go down and look at business service growth, this is where you're getting into your middle and upper um, income jobs. You can see um, California's about the national average. Um, uh, professional business services is the largest category of high wage jobs. You can see New York um, is actually below the national average. And one of the things that we're seeing in New York, uh, as you can tell, that's my hometown, um, is the movement of these jobs to other locations. Um, and you can see Tennessee and Texas are just kicking butt. I mean, this is where people are going. You go, you go let's say the, right now, you've got major financial firms moving to, to uh, Nashville. There are people going to Nashville from uh, the tech industry, entertainment industry. And so what we're seeing is this shift of where uh, the economic dynamism is um, strongest. Now, there are one of the big things that I think is driving this um, uh, and driving this growth, and this is why the whole climate change issue will become very important, is that there's this enormous um, demand for energy. What the heartland has is resources. And I, you know, I could get into the whole question of who's going to grow the food, um, who's going to supply the energy, and it's obviously going to be in these parts of the country. You can see where the shale uh, deposits are. Um, it's going to be a very interesting thing for the, the um, I'm a lifelong Democrat at the Democratic Convention um, when uh, there's now this talk of an Appalachian pipeline for gas, and Appalachia desperately needs this. Um, and will the Democratic Party say, no, we're against these pipelines? Um, which has been happening quite a bit. As you can see, obviously, Texas has a lot. Now, you say, well, what about California? Well, we have, we have a lot of oil and gas, but we're too good to use it. Um, so what we're actually doing in, insanely is importing oil from Saudi Arabia. I guess, I guess the people who leave the state think that's a, uh, a more progressive regime. Um, but when you look at also New York, also refuses to do it. And so it's really interesting, if you take counties in New York, adjacent to counties in, in Pennsylvania, those that have used their shale resources are doing infinitely better. And of course, employment has been strong, and now, of course, it's, it's coming back again. But we're talking about um, about 300,000 jobs, and the recent studies are showing that energy companies are, um, some of them are median wages now about 200,000 a year. So, pretty good opportunity. So one of the things we think is going to drive this is not only the energy industry itself, but what it does to the cost of production for other things. So if you can see um, the, what the salaries were in 2016, but if you work for ExxonMobil, you're making more than that. Um, one of the other big factors, so you've got these resources as a factor, you've got regulation, which we'll get back to as a factor. One of the really big things is cost of living. Um, we uh, looked at the cost of living in terms of where it's gotten highest, and you can see it's the Northeast Corridor um, and the West Coast. The um, center of the country actually has not had a big increase. Now, one of the reasons this is happening is, um, and this will be a little bit more, I think, on the Free Market Institute uh, uh, agenda, is what we call urban containment. What we have is in many of the Northeastern states, and even in California, policies where we say you can't build anything outside of a certain um, area. Like for instance, if you drive from San Jose to Salinas, which is a farming community about an hour south of San Jose, you drive home and say, where is everybody? It's completely empty, you can't develop there, and yet San Jose now has up some of the highest housing prices in the country. So when you force the, um, the price of land up by, by deciding that you're not going to allow areas to develop, 
it doesn't just make lower prices on the periphery, it makes lower uh, it, it makes lower prices in the city. That's why one of the reasons why Houston's been more competitive. You want to have a competitive land market. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing is you have rapid growth, for instance, in Dallas and Houston and, and, and other cities that don't have these containments. Where you have this containment, but what we're seeing in California in particular, and again, I know California the best, um, what we're seeing in California is essentially we're not allowing people to live near where they work. So we have all these people going, let's say, the Silicon Valley driving two, three hours, driving from the high desert of um, outside LA all the way into LA and Orange counties. And this has created enormous levels of poverty. And, you know, as um, we can discuss later, California now has the highest level of poverty of any place uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the United States of any state. But what kills me is at the same time that we are creating the greatest uh, bounty of wealth in the history of mankind, we have the highest poverty rate. And as an old social democrat, I find that pretty reprehensible. And that's all being done by progressives. Um, so if you take a look at what the effect of those prices, of, uh, of those policies have been, if you go back to 1970, I, I moved to California in 1971, um, you can see prices were not that much out of whack. You know, the median multiple, the relationship between median a house price to median income, household income, was about the same everywhere. So if a house was more expensive in San Francisco, people were making more. Yeah, as you can see, as we began to, to ramp up the regulations, and now they're, they're absolutely insane. I mean, you, you have to have solar, it has to be zero emissions, it's got to be near a bus stop. It's, it, it's so expensive that many of the big developers in California are keeping their offices in California and developing every place but California. So as you can see, this has led to very high prices. But also another thing is because we have very high prices when there's a recession, we get these precipitous drops. But as you can see right now, we're at uh, eight, and most of the areas um, in Texas are at three. Uh, the other thing is well, we have a problem with supply. We don't have, um, we, we don't respond to the market. And so even places like Riverside, San Bernardino, uh, do not produce as much housing per capita as Raleigh, Nashville, Houston, Orlando, Dallas. So our refusal to, to build housing obviously um, makes, uh, makes housing more expensive. I, you know, I sold my house in Los Angeles, we have a very nice house in Orange County. And uh, I always say to my wife, we should send Jerry Brown a Christmas card because his policies are making our house worth more and more because you can't, you could not build our house anywhere in California today. I mean, it would, if you did, it would be $10 million. So, so what you're seeing is the areas in the country that are growing, and this is most important for millennials, because millennials are generally going to be in buying their first house, and so they, and, and they're, it's going to be a starter house, and they really need to keep the, the price reasonable. So this is what my student said to me. He said, well, I'd like to stay here. But you know, if I move to Dallas, I'm all of a sudden going to be able to uh, afford a house. And so what happens is millennials, you know, despite appearances to the contrary, are actually human beings, and they're they're you know they're actually mammals. And at the end of the day, they, most of them are going to want to get married and settle down. And they're not going to be able to do it in places that are outrageously uh, regulated and expensive. So if you take a look at housing costs. Uh, you can see Orange, Los Angeles, way, you know, twice what Austin is, and obviously considerably uh, more than, than Dallas, Fort Worth, San Francisco, San Jose. So here's an amazing statistic. In the midst of the greatest, arguably the greatest economic boom in history in terms of assets, we are seeing people leave San Jose. As the net out migration. Now there's something wrong there. Because well, everything I learned in, in urban history was when a place was doing great, people moved there. People went to Detroit in the 1920s because of the car industry. Now, we have an odd situation that we have enormous wealth being created, but people are actually leaving those places. And, and again, this notion of poverty rate, so I was speaking at the University of Mississippi and I congratulated them for having a lower poverty rate than we have. Um, and again, you can see that you know, New York also uh, quite high. 
California, we, California was never, ever remotely close to this number. So what we've done in what one might call the present progressive agenda is what we've done is, is we've created a very, what I would call, feudal society where a few people do very well, um, but most people don't do well at all. The middle class is shrinking and the amount of poverty is, is you know, getting worse and worse. And of course, uh, this also uh, it's minorities in particular. This is one of the things that um, we're working on now, which is what we call the Social Justice Index, which is, you know, everyone's always talking about social justice, social justice is, so, well, to me, social justice is somebody who was able to start a company, somebody had higher incomes, somebody was able to buy a house, somebody was able um, to have a stable family environment. Actually, California, which is the center of the, uh, of, of the progressive world right now, you can see Latino and African American um, incomes are considerably lower than the national average. And I've done a lot of work comparing Texas and California, particularly for Latinos, and the differences in home ownership, as you'll see, are quite uh, marked. So to take a look, for instance, in the LA area, uh, um, African Americans own about 30% about own their own home. In Florida, it's 40%. Texas is about 40%. Um, Boston is also very, very low. Same thing is basically true of Hispanics. And what we're seeing in the California market is that actually the, the ownership of African Americans and Hispanics is dropping precipitously because many Hispanics and African Americans bought homes in the 40s and 50s when they were affordable, but there's no way their children can afford to buy homes, which is why um, some of them believe. So let's go into a little bit of the, of the demographics of the areas of the coal mine. Uh, this is where the population change has been since the 2010. And again, you can see the South has uh, grown faster than everywhere else. So again, I would say business climate and housing costs are a big factor. Uh, where are people moving? Again, they're, they're moving to areas where the uh, median house price is lower. Uh, and if you take a look at the uh, population, the annual population growth. Um, again, you can see uh, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, towards the bottom, you see again California um, is actually um, has fairly low population growth. And in the new census, to my amazement, the county of Los Angeles lost population. But this is unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this. This is telling us something about what's coming in the future. And the movement of college educated people. Where are college educated people? You know, we're always being told, well, if college educated, they all want to go to Boston and New York and LA and San Francisco. Actually, the biggest growth is in Boston, Orlando, Houston, uh, Nashville, Charlotte. Uh, again, the same thing opportunity and, low, and relatively low prices. Now, if you have low prices and no opportunity, people aren't going to go there. I mean, they're not flocking to Youngstown, Ohio, uh, but they are moving to cities in Texas. Very interesting, foreign-born population. Look at the growth in Austin, Houston, San Antonio, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. You know, uh, right now, does anyone know what the most diverse county in America is? Anybody have a guess? Houston. In, in Houston, you're Fort Bend. Fort Bend. And if you go out to Fort Bend County, it's really interesting. First of all, it's literally one third white, one third uh, Asian, uh, one, th one quarter white, one quarter Asian, one quarter African American, um, and, and, one, uh, uh, and one quarter Latino. So it's literally every group. And it has the, the largest Hindu town in the United States. So if you want to put Indian food in the, in the Houston area, you want to go out to Fort Bend. It's about 20 miles from, from downtown Houston. And again, you can see the, the immigrants. They're the canaries in the coal mine. They don't have a commitment to where they, they have to be. They don't have two, three generations of people where you know, you're going to move there because your family's there. Look at LA. LA was the great immigrant magnet of the, of the 80s. It is now the lowest growth of any place in the country in terms of immigrants. This is, immigrants aren't stupid. And they, and, and, and they know where am I going to go my family's going to be better, where my economic prospects are better. And, you know, frankly, most of them want to buy a house. You know, sometimes people say to me, well, you know, 
Um, people in Asia, for instance, live in very dense conditions. I said, yeah. And they said, well, then they, they don't mind the density. I said, well, if they like density, they would have stayed home. Um, so as you can see, the growth is, again, to, generally speaking, to been uh, these places. And to be careful, this is really a statewide look. 2010 to 2016, California's immigration grew by 5%, Texas by 14%, Florida by 16%. Now, of course, some of the states up in the Great Plains are even higher, but the base is very low. But look, the, look at even Arizona, right next door, is almost twice, growing almost twice as fast. And Arizona has a big uh, immigrant population. So what we're seeing is the new America that's just beginning to happen, that we're just seeing the beginning, is very different than the America that most of our urban planners and most of the media uh, thinks exists. And then, to tell you the truth, even in the financial world, when I show these numbers, they're shocked because they read the New York Times because they don't know anything. Uh, <laughs> Um, again, domestic migration, the big uh, movement out is um, to the Northeast Corridor, West Coast states. Uh, the only ones who are really uh, getting a lot of migration still Seattle um, in particular because A, there's been a boom there, and as, as expensive as it is, it's still much cheaper than California. And again, it, it, you can see that. Now, the question is, why does this matter? And, and one of the things that matters has to do a lot with your generation. Now, it's constantly written about in the, um, in the national media. Man, millennials, you know, they don't, they don't want to own the house. They're too smart. They don't want to do that. They want, they want to you know, give up all their money and rent for the rest of their lives. Um, what we found is when you actually do a, a, a survey, millennials are about as, as interested in owning a home as anybody else. If they have a problem, it's because they, they, can't, they can't afford it. But the idea that millennials are somehow this new species that doesn't want to have children, doesn't want to own a house, and, I mean, you know, you're still mammals. Um, uh, and as you can see, look at the millennial growth numbers we now found from 2000 to 2010. Orange and LA have very, very low millennial growth. The big millennial growth in California is San Bernardino and Riverside, which is the outer suburbs of LA. But then you can see, Dallas, Charlotte, Denver. This is telling us where the country is going. Because where you go is where the country is going to be formed. Just like my generation moved to California in large numbers, and California became the sort of the most powerful and important state. I think that's going to change over time. Uh, this was a recent study by my friend Bill Fry at Brookings. And again, you can see where the net migration is. Um, you see, obviously, you see Houston. All the dark blue, um, Charlotte is the, one of the dark blue, um, and again, Denver as well. And the big losers, the red dots, Miami, interestingly enough. Miami is very high housing prices, uh, given its economy. Chicago, New York, uh, LA, San Diego. So this is the greatest net migration gains of millennials, 25 to 34. And you can see once again that uh, the biggest gainer has been Houston. You will, I, I, I called a good friend of mine at the time, she said, did you guys have to write about this? And she said, next time you're in New York, we'll have a drink and I'll explain why. Uh, because you know what, and I used to write for the Times, you know, they don't want to hear this information. The fact that New York leads the nation in losing uh, uh, the millennials and LA is second. So obviously, people are voting with their feet. Um, and then, they, then the other argument I've heard from, well, the people leaving, they're all the stupid people and they're the older people. Actually, in reality, the people who are leaving are fairly well educated. And if you look at income, the group that's leaving at a very rapid rate compared to the past is about 100 to 200,000. And, and why is that happening? Well, because if you make $150,000 in Orange County or LA, you have no chance of buying a house. And that's basically, you, it's just impossible. Because if your house is $800,000, $900,000, you're probably uh, not going to be able to do it. And that's one of the things that's driving this migration. Same thing with age. The group that leaves the most is 35 to 44. Uh, people will put up with some of this 
in their in their twenties, but as they get older, uh, and as you can see, yeah, we're we're losing some of the the older folks, but the big group that we're losing 35, 44. When I talk to business people in um, in California, uh, uh, they say, you know, I can hold on to the twenty something somewhat, but one company said we've actually set up satellite offices in San Antonio and Dallas for our thirty something. I mean, at some point, and look, there are always going to be people who are going to say, all right, I'll rent for the rest of my life, I'll live in an apartment, that's okay. Most people, that's not what they want, and so as you can see, we're losing that group. This is the biggest thing that I'm trying to uh, tell our business people in California. You can't have this go on forever. It, you know, this is exactly what happened to Detroit, which is when, when people got into their 30s and they saw there was no opportunity. In California, it's a little different situation, but that's a group we're losing. And a lot of companies that rely on more mature managers have problems. Now, if you're a startup company in San Francisco, generally speaking, first of all, we get a lot of those kids um, in those startups are from wealthy families because, after all, they can't afford the rent. Um, and what you do is you take a 20 something, you work with the debt for four years, and they leave. But if you're an engineering company or an energy company or a manufacturing company, you got to go someplace else. You just it just doesn't work to to be in a situation where people leave in their thirties because you have people working on projects for five, ten years at a time. Um, this I think you might find interesting: the uh, migration to California and Texas. Um, not a lot, not a huge among the older people. Because no offense, but I don't know Texas for retirement. Maybe not, you know, not so great. I mean, if you're looking for amenities and all that, it's you know, it's not terrible. But if you're a Californian, there are lots of other places to go. But look at 35 to 44. That's that's where the losses are. And, and 26 to 34. And now this is from the IRS data, which is the best data we can get. Um, so then the question is, if you have this going on, and then you have, you, they, they'll say, well, yeah, the young people, they're different. They don't want to have. They don't want to buy a house. Well, about 81 percent of all the detached houses in the uh, uh, that are uh, um, 81 percent of all the, the houses bought by under 35 are detached. You know, let's face it. Most of you grew up in a house, mostly in the suburbs, and you might want to live in the city in your 20s. But by the time you're in your 30s and 40s, you're going to try to duplicate aspects of how you grew up. I'm not saying you're going to have to eat the food your mother made or, um, or you know, have the prejudices of your father. But, but, but generally speaking, you're going to want to recreate for your children something like what you have. And we, we find that, that most millennials actually want to live in suburbs, about 10% in cities. And by the way, this interesting, it's been 10 to 15% for about 40 years. But if you read the media, you would think that's everybody. And the reason is, that the people at the very top of the society, their children move to San Francisco and Brooklyn because their parents can pay the rent. As I always say to my, uh, I have a 25 year old who lives in Arizona, I said, you know, I'm not gonna help you if you move to, to the Bay Area when you move to New York because I don't, I don't wanna help your rent and the rent is gonna be twice or three times what, what it would be in Tucson. Uh, so what we're seeing is the decline of home ownership in California, you can see, look at San Jose, 40% decline, 40% decline. Now, there's been a decline nationally, about 15%, 40% decline. San Jose, if you are not familiar with it, was your typical big suburban sprawl. It was a place where engineers from the Midwest moved, bought a house, and had an apricot tree. Um, that just doesn't exist anymore. Um, and What's happening is that people, now, if you're my generation, let's say you bought a house in Cupertino in 1985 for $250,000, that house is now $2.5 million. You're pretty happy with this situation, but obviously the new person coming in can't do anything about it. And as you can see, this is now accelerated. So as, uh, despite there's a, a bit of an increase um, um, in terms of wealth, Actually, people continue to live. And I thought you might find this interesting. This was from Joint Ventures Silicon Valley. 41% of, of young employees, 18 to 34, apply.
planning to leave in the next 12 months. The big nightmare for some of the more established looking value companies is they think they're just going to run out of people to work because they, young people are, are leaving. What some people do is they work four or five years, they get the stamp, I work for Amazon, I work for, for Apple, and then they get a job any place they want. And they leave. Because when they get to be towards becoming adults, they can't hack it. Um, and down the road, if you want to go look a little further, uh, fewer children. Uh, we now have, LA has had the biggest drop in the number of children. We built all these schools that turned out we didn't need them. Uh, and again, you can see where the, the, the population of children has grown. Boston, Charlotte, Dallas, definitely getting, getting the theme right. Uh, Nashville, Phoenix. Um, San Francisco uh, was a low for a long time. You know, San Francisco's famous because there are more dogs than kids. Um, and actually, there are now more drug addicts in San Francisco than high school students. So that's a great success story. Um, so at the end of it, if we're going to deal with these issues, we have to deal with the idea of what is sustainability. Because a lot of what's driving this in California is really this, this, this idea that we have that California's on a mission to save the planet. Now, the, the, the actual reality is if California fell into the ocean tomorrow, it would have no effect at all. Because A, we're not a big emitter, and frankly, when people move out of California, their carbon footprint grows just because of the climate. So what we've managed to do is we've been managed to make everyone's life miserable through regulation. Um, and we now rank uh, 40th in per capita uh, reductions in GHG. So all the things that they're doing to the average California, like for instance, the price of gas now is over $4 a gallon. Now we're talking about a state that literally lies on, on supply of oil and gas. But because of the taxes and because we don't allow anyone to drill, uh, we basically are in a situation where our, uh, uh, these policies are not doing anything. Now I personally think a lot of this is what we might call virtue signaling. It has nothing to do with the climate or the environment. Uh, but, the, but it's very interesting because what's beginning to happen is there's a, some consciousness of the bigger minority community that these policies which drive up the price of housing, the price of energy. Look, I make enough money. If, if, if gas was fifteen dollars a gallon, and okay, I'd ride my bike more. You know, it's not a big deal. But if I'm a construction worker living in Riverside and I'm driving a a a, a, a truck to work in Long Beach every day, that's about an hour and a half each way, it makes a very big difference. So there's a lawsuit which we cannot take coverage for, but by uh, the attorney and Jennifer Hernandez from 200 civil rights leaders saying that the California climate policies are discriminatory to Hispanics and African Americans and poor people. Uh, the problem is the media refuses to report it, so you know, it's, it's always a problem getting the message out. But fundamentally, the, what we have is the wealthiest people in society so that they can look at themselves in the mirror and feel good about themselves. Everybody else has to suffer, and the poor people suffer the worst. So is there a different future that we can have? I think there is. I mean, we have uh, the, the, uh, one of the really interesting things is there is no support for people working at home. Probably the biggest way you can reduce emissions uh, because I think fundamentally, at the end of the day, the agenda is really control, not really get, getting anything done. And if people work at home, they might be independent. Um, and we're moving in completely absurd directions. I was up, uh, I was in Charlotte uh, yesterday, and this guy was up saying, oh, we have to have transit. He was from Gwinnett County. He had been talking about how Gwinnett County had outperformed Atlanta, which has a completely uh, expensive and fairly worthless transit system. Um, and he said, well, you know, the, what you need is transit. I said, well, why is Gwinnett doing better without the big transit system situation? I didn't really have an answer. Um, but we're at the verge of something very exciting, which is the movement towards autonomous vehicles. I think we'll eventually get to autonomous electric vehicles, and that will change everything. If you can get into an autonomous vehicle and drive to Dallas, it may take you a few hours, but if, but if you can sit there and read it and listen to music 
and, you're, and, and, and you can go much faster because of the controls. I think we're at the verge of a period where dispersion will actually uh, increase, and that is going to be very good for uh, a lot of the smaller communities. So if we look at what's going to happen over time, uh, the heartland states, as we define them, will have the vast majority of all the growth in the United States up to 2040. And as we disperse, people who maybe are now in Charlotte or now in Houston, Dallas, start thinking about maybe there are other smaller communities because of the internet and because of, of it, autonomous vehicles that you can now actually live in very comfortably. Um, and I think that's where we're going to see it. So what's happened now in terms of what's going on in the um, uh, in the movement of largely the bigger cities of the Sun Belt will now begin to move into some of the smaller cities. We have some signs of that in about a year I'll have over there. Um, and that's we're already beginning to see that people are moving to smaller metropolitan areas, like 500 to a million, and over a million is actually what people are moving away from. I think this trend will continue. And we are beginning to see, uh, for the first time in years, that the small metro areas um, are beginning to, once again, uh, there was a period where they had declined, and now they're beginning to pick up again. The large metropolitan areas are declining, and we're starting to see even the non-metropolitan areas, what we call micropolitan areas, small towns, 50,000, 100,000, some of them are gaining population. And, that, and they had been written off as for dead, and, um, Apparently, they're not cooperating. Um, so, I just want to conclude with a few things, and then I'd love to get your questions. I think that we're, we're going to see with the rise of the tangible production, the demand on the global level, uh, lots of middle class jobs moving to the center of the country. Um, the population will follow those jobs. Um, the climate solutions that we have to come up with have to be ones that don't create more poverty. Um, and I think they can be done in lots of intelligent ways. Um, and I think the question is really going to be, will the areas of, uh, of the country that are made up of smaller cities, will those cities be competitive? And what we're finding initially is some cities are much more competitive and are already gaining. Uh, any city with good hospitals, a big university, um, and various kinds of amenities are doing well. In the future, many small towns will die, but many small towns will thrive. And we're trying to identify which ones. So anyway, that's basically what we're, we're talking about. I think it makes for a great future for places like Lubbock and for many other communities around the country. And long term, the strength of the United States is going to be that we have not only all the, the high-end industries that exist on the coast, but we have this tremendous productive middle of the country where costs are low. And I think that's something that we have that, that neither China nor uh, the European Union enjoy. So anyway, I'd, again, I'd like to take your questions. Thank you.